It's the things that you can bring to what you're doing. Bring to the filmmaking craft that maybe not everybody else is doing. Maybe not everybody else can do or has thought to do. That's what's going to distinguish the thing. How did you even begin? I didn't go to film school because I couldn't get into film school. I just thought it was such a fantastic idea. You have to play to your strengths. You have to do something that really excites you. Learned, in a sense, how to make a short film in a weekend. Knocked it out of the park again. We felt very strongly going into it that we had a story to tell, and that's, that's the thing you really need. Can you create a, a very stripped down, very tight production machine that would then be applied to making a feature film? In various ways in my work, I've tried to echo whatever's different about that. Where did you even, you know, it took you so long to get this going, but where, how did it all come about for you? I think making films on a grand scale is what I got into movies for. The other fascinating thing about you is that you work with your lovely wife. You know, Emma, Emma's produced says. all my films. My father knew I wanted to be a filmmaker, but he advised me. He said, go and get a real degree. And to be honest, we only go into a film if, if we know that we've got a story to tell. As a writer, to hear somebody quote your line or something. How do you keep topping yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's very kind of you to say. Uh, I mean, I'm really excited for this one. Christopher Nolan is probably my favorite director. I think he will go down in history as the best or one of the best directors of all time. And in terms of success, he is at the pinnacle of his hierarchy. Every producer would gladly give him money and every actor wants to work with him. But what is it about his product, his movies, that makes them so amazing? What is it that makes them so great? That when you watch them, it feels like you're being taken out of your seat and transported into a different world. How is it that you can watch his movies two, three, four, five times and still enjoy them? How are his movies so good? And I think the only way to find the answer is by looking to him. There are uh, alchemists who for over a hundred years in various windowless rooms, basements, what have you, all across the world have practiced a very special form of alchemy. That is turning silver and plastic into dreams. And these dreams can be run through a projector, thrown onto a screen where they will spark the imagination and emotion of audiences as they have all across the world for so long, for so many generations of filmmakers. The thing that's so amazing about Nolan films is that we are able to see the world through a different perspective. We are being shown the way that he views the world. And in a lot of ways, this makes him relatable to a lot of different entrepreneurs and founders whose company is part of them. His movies are part of him. They're like an extension of his. He's not a normal guy either. He loves science. He studies Victorian era novels, and he just gets lost in this world of puzzles sometimes. He loves science, and a lot of times what scientific exploration actually is is just that a puzzle and Christopher Nolan kind of shines at those Tom Schoen spent three years doing interviews with Christopher Nolan and one of the quotes was as Nolan talked his powder blue eyes betrayed the distant glint of someone doing math problems in his head three weeks in advance the thing about Nolan is that when he makes films he makes films that are a part of him he makes puzzles and as an audience it's your job to figure out these puzzles and I think that's part of what makes Christopher Nolan so amazing the fact that every one of his movies is is just a puzzle that he goes around in his head. We're able to look at the world through his point of view and it's our job to figure out the puzzle. It's captivating and I think the key to understanding Christopher Nolan is to understand the way his movies work. Keep in mind, of course, this video will contain the spoilers. I've been interested in non-chronological narrative structures for quite a long time. And once you start thinking about the idea of point of view, I think time shifting, the idea of non-linear structures or non-chronological structures uh, becomes a, a real freedom. And for me, it kind of found its ultimate expression. In Memento was Nolan's first major feature film, and already you can see a lot of what Christopher Nolan actually is. The real theme about this movie is memories. In the movie, the main character has short-term memory loss, so he's unable to form any new memories, but he's trying to find the man who killed his wife. So in order to do that, he's having to all constantly write things down. He has tattoos of clues on himself, all sorts of stuff that's just trying to help him remember what he's supposed to do. At the end of the movie, you find out that 
he is actually the murderer and everyone around him has just kind of been lying with him playing with him but he just he doesn't know he can't remember all of his writings are clues that he gave to himself and he's left with the choice of having to remember the truth or forgetting it however instead of admitting that he is the murderer he chooses to forget he burns his writings and he just moves on continuing the random chase of finding the man who killed his wife so where the the element of, of time and the distortion of time i think comes into it is that in really trying to put the audience into uh, Leonard's mindset, you sort of enter into his confusion as to the sequence of events and also as to the overall time period that the film is taking place in. The point of Memento is to say, how much can you truly trust the memories that are in your head? Are you absolutely 100% sure that you can trust your memory? It's an interesting question when you really think about it and makes you think about how often you actually use your memory. It is fundamental to your way of life. And I know what I'm saying may sound obvious, but there are times in your life where your mind will actually hide memories from you to protect you from the truth. These are called repressed memories and they can only be found with hours of psychological digging. Sometimes they can be triggered by stimuli out in your environment, but how can you actually be sure that you can trust your memory and that your brain isn't hiding things from you? These are the types of questions that Nolan is able to bring about in our lives, and it is why his puzzles are so amazing. All of us can relate. We all have memories, but we don't often think about it, and even less do we have any answers. You can say that you have your memory. You can say that you're sure that you don't have any repressed memories, that you don't have any trauma, or that your brain isn't hiding things from you, but how can you actually know that? There's not an answer to this puzzle. It's just, it's just a thought pondering in your mind. And that's part of what makes this so amazing. There is no right answer. We needed to, to finish the story and, and put it together as one, one piece of work on, on trilogy. And so we, we, we felt very strongly going into it that we had a story to tell. And that's, that's the thing we really need. The Dark Knight trilogy, but more specifically The Dark Knight, is a play on the ethical dilemma of chaos. In the movie, the villain's only goal is to watch the world burn. He doesn't have any weaknesses because he doesn't care about anything. He is simply, as he likes to say, a dog chasing butterflies. In The Dark Knight Rises, this is actually taken a step further, and the city actually begins to be governed by criminals whose view on morality and ethics are just backwards. It shows you what would happen if there were pure anarchy, pure chaos. The city of Gotham is meant to portray our society as a whole, and he does an amazing job with this, and I think especially he does an amazing job with the Joker. What we do in The, the Dark Knight is we just sort of test that using the character of the Joker, who's this extraordinary force of, of anarchy. Somebody who just lives and, and delights in taking people's rule sets and, and turning them you know, against themselves. He wants to watch the world burn. He doesn't follow any set of rules because he doesn't have any. The Joker is Nolan's way of questioning the rules that we follow as a society, and he uses the Batman to relate to us. The weird thing is though that the Joker isn't always wrong. At one point in the movie, he talks about why we're so okay with following the plan, even if the plan is horrifying. We expect soldiers to be killed. We expect criminals to be criminals, but that's kind of horrifying. We only panic when someone of importance is killed or when something happens to someone who has a big following because that's not part of the plan. These quotes, again, are an ethical puzzle that let us question not just our moral values, but how we respond to certain situations in society. The scary thing is that there is a little bit of the Joker inside every single one of us. There is a part of us that wants to live without rules, that wants the world to burn for what the world has done to us, and it's a very large ethical dilemma. There are so many times when we want to abandon all the guidelines that govern us and just live without any rules, but the moment we do that we cross into a territory where we become the Joker. For some reason, we don't, and I think exploring that line will lead to many moral truths. Relativity, you know, which is what was taking great pains to explain to me, the relationship between time and gravity and mass and everything all the rest, and sort of got this intuitive sense of, okay, I kind of get why it's not possible. Probably a fan favorite, Interstellar is such an amazing example of why Nolan is obsessed with puzzles because it's kind of a puzzle of physics, of space and time, and it's so well done, it's so well done. Interstellar is so well done. Interstellar is a great example of why Nolan's films are not just something that are some random thing that's shown on TV, but 
Interstellar is an actual representation of what we can know about space and time as humans. Nolan actually worked with an actual physicist to make the movie as realistic as possible so that they could actually show something that could possibly be in the future. One of these ideas is a wormhole opening up in our galaxy. A wormhole is like a fold in space and time. So when you enter the wormhole, you're transported into a different part of space and time. Uh, in the movie, it leads to three different planets that could save the human race. The idea that not only a wormhole was placed in our universe, but that a higher form of intelligence was actually able to place a wormhole somewhere is definitely something to think about and makes us think about the possibilities of of how we can move towards that in our in our own little world. Another one of these ideas is a tesseract, which is a four dimensional structure that allows you to perceive any moment in time past, present, or future. This is how you're able to wrap up the film when you find out that the main character is actually the one orchestrating the events throughout the entire film. The great thing about the scientific method, you know, science seeking to disprove itself, right. just that literally being a scientific method, because I would... It's really interesting because this movie combines science and film, and it shows the possibilities of what we can do as a human race. It shows the possibilities in physics and space exploration, and it just inspires you in a way that no other movie does because it's it's told in the way of a puzzle and it's essentially the puzzle of the universe and one that we're working at solving every day as human race as humans he he's essentially putting theoretical concepts on the big screen and making them real and i'm just so excited to see how many award-winning physicists in the future will have been expired inspired by this film very often ask me why am I interested in time? I say, well, because I've always lived in it. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, and we are. We, we feel very trapped in it. It's like we try and hang on to the moment. We take photographs of everything. Right. We take, you know, right. We desperately want to hang on to this reality. This is probably my favorite Christopher Nolan film because it is just pure puzzle. One of his favorite elements to play around in all of his movies is time. In Memento, the story is told backwards. In Inception, time speeds up and slows down in dreams. In Interstellar, time dilation is introduced, and in Tenet, time is reversed. Kind of. What really happens is that the entropy of an object can either move forwards or backwards in time. The puzzling part about this movie is that no matter whether you're going forwards or backwards in time, what's happened happens, so the event will stay the same, whether it's going forwards or backwards. It's still on the same timeline. And this is a different way of looking at time. It's really strange. It's honestly really hard to explain. Here, try this visual. Visual. So as you can see, you can't change what has happened because what has happened has already happened and will have already happened, if that makes sense. Throughout the movie, you get to see the same scene twice just from a different point of view. One of them with the guy going forward in time, the other one with the guy going backwards in time. What time travel allows us to do is to say, okay, but what if we could? What if we could preserve that moment? What if we could revisit that moment yeah. genuinely? Well, that's all science fiction is about what if. Yes. What if we could travel through space? Yeah. What if we could travel? This is just a kind of a different way of looking at time travel. Instead of moving to a different point in time, you are simply switching directions forwards and backwards. It's really interesting how they made this movie too. And it just makes you think about if this is actually possible, if we can actually reverse the entropy of an object. And again, it's just these puzzles of the universe universe that no one is putting out into these movies that makes them so realistic and so amazing. We don't know if it's possible or even something close to that is possible. Well, I think with every film, if I've done my job right, you're left with interesting questions at the end of it. And in the case of Tenet, uh, the reference to Oppenheimer, the reference to this incredible moment in history where the scientists of the Manhattan Project could not completely rule out the possibility of a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world mm -hmm. when they set off that first device, the gadget as they call it. Um, that just stayed with me. This last one is one of Nolan's biggest films yet, and once again, it is filled with tons of questions for the audience. One thing that he constantly questioned while making this movie was, how could a group of people perform an experiment knowing that they had a chance of blowing up the world? In a world where we're constantly threatened of extinction by nuclear weapons, how could this not be an absolute masterpiece? And it really makes us question what was done at Los Alamos. They made a bomb because if they didn't make a bomb, then someone else would have and during a war that was something that they couldn't afford to let happen 
but was it worth it? The movie makes us wonder that with the state of the world, did they actually start a chain reaction that would end everything? This weapon was a massive discovery and it was a huge advancement in science, but it has the potential to destroy everyone. This movie is maybe less of a puzzle and more of just pure biopic, but it still makes us question about how we are using these weapons today. My life is like a Christopher Nolan movie. I don't really understand what's going on. <laughs> what would you tell him or, or her? <laughs> I'd say don't try to understand it, just feel it. I skipped out on a ton of amazing films, but I think that even just from the ones I showed, you can see that they're pure Nolan. These films come from Nolan's head and you can tell that he just loves puzzles, that he loves film, and that he loves merging the two into one to create what he has created. You can tell that he has a deep curiosity about these subjects, about time, about space, about morality, and I think at the end of the day, that's what we can take away from him. Deep curiosity is contagious. When you go out into the world to make something, you have to be interested in what you are making. You have to love what you do. And when you go out into the world with a deep curiosity, with a passion for something, people will kind of be drawn to you. And I think when you draw those people to you, when we come together to explore these curiosities, then and only then will we be able to figure out the deepest secrets of the universe.